Good morning. Um, today we are going to be doing some recap of topic one, global hazards from the OCRB geography. Um, today I'm going to be focused on the kind of one of the parts of that topic, which is the hazardous weather section. Today I'm only going to be focused on the content. Next week I'll be doing releasing a video about the case studies. Okay, so this is a relatively short video in comparison today compared to previous weeks. So let's get started. So first up is about the global circulation system. Now this is something that seems to confuse few, quite a few students and we see it at a couple of points. We kind of mention it a bit, a little bit maybe in climate change, but we also talk about it in ecosystems as well. Okay, so it's something that you do need to be familiar with because it has a big impact on what we learn in global hazards and also sustaining ecosystems. So as you can see then from the, um, on the screen here, you can see that we have these different cells, the Hadley cell, the feral cell, and the polar cell. Now this is all because of warm and cool air moving around. Okay, we know that we have the normally we have the sun. Okay, and the sun is obviously over here. Okay, sending its energy, heating the earth. Now, at the closest point here at the equator is where it's going to be its warmest. So here we have lots of warm air rising up. Now as air rises, it starts to cool, it condenses, and we get clouds. I call that the three C's. Okay, so cools, condenses and clouds. So this leads to lots of rainfall then falling at the equator. And you can see that, okay, and think about what kind of environments you find at the equator, things like rainforest, okay, is shows you how much rainfall we're going to get. Now, what that also leads to, okay, is something we call like low pressure, okay, which creates kind of a bit of a space underneath, all right? I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, as that air rises, Okay, you can see that it travels in different directions, trying to send some of that sun's heat towards the north and towards the south pole. Now, it can't get it there, it's too far. Okay, and I will put video to this in um, on your homework that you might give you a few ideas extra how to look at this. But the key thing is that as it kind of gets to about 30 degrees latitude, north and south, this cool air, remember cold air is heavier than warm air, this cool air starts to sink back down. Okay, now when it sinks back down, um, it starts to dry out. So what we end up having around about 30 degrees latitude is actually really dry air. So we end up with these really dry conditions at 30 degrees latitude. We tend to find lots of deserts here. So for example, in the Northern Hemisphere over Africa, we find obviously the Sahara Desert between 10 and 30 degrees. Uh, because all the rainfall's falling at the equator, as that air moves to these areas, it's got less and less rainfall. And any rainfall, that any moisture that is left in it obviously is lost through evaporation as that air sinks and starts to warm up. And that air then travels back through the, what we call the trade winds back to the equator. And that happens in the south as well. Now, some of that warm air will carry on um, going towards the poles. And we move into the feral cell, which is kind of where, we are located, where we're located really. And we get quite a mixture. So here we've now got this kind of, again, we've got these dry conditions to the bottom of the feral cells. And then we've got these wetter conditions in between the polar cell and the feral cell and again we kind of kind of towards the top end of this feral cell so we're going to more likely to have periods of time where we're going to get this wetter weather and hence why we associate wet weather with the uk so here again we've got that air rising so now i've got low pressure sorry i should have said before that this bit we have obviously high pressure air sinking so and this bit is a low pressure then as we kind of go towards the top of the polar, polar cell, okay, we then get high pressure again. Now, just because the poles are covered in snow, that doesn't actually mean they get much precipitation. In fact, they hardly get any. They actually can be classed as deserts because they get very little precipitation, very dry areas. So they have high pressure. Okay. So in those kind of situations, that's what we want to be thinking about and considering when we're talking about this. Okay. So you can see this shows you where low and high pressure is, and this is replicated in the south as well. Another diagram just showing this a little bit here as well, okay, showing these conditions. So on the here is a little task you can have a go at thinking about, in okay, case so you might want to pause the video here and think about what I've said so far, think about your revision. What kind of weather would we expect to these different conditions? Okay, what's the climate like? Okay, and when we talk about the climate, we want to know about how wet or dry it is and also maybe how warm or cold it is. Okay, so you need to think about its location, okay, and the type of pressure we receive in that might tell you a little bit of that. So it might be worth pausing, having a go. So, 
let's have a look at the answers then. So you can see down here, A, we've got low pressure, but also very close to the, at the equator. So we've got these really hot and wet conditions leading to these tropical conditions. B, okay, you can see this is the same again in north and south of the equator. Okay, at this 30 degree latitude, you can see these hot and dry conditions. Still close to the equator, so it's still going to be hot, sun's energy strong, but also we're in a high pressure area, so the air is really dry. C, this more mild and wet. We're further away from the equator now. The temperature is not as strong, so it's going to be a bit cooler. So it's mild and also quite wet as well. And we find lots of deciduous forests, a bit like we find around the UK. And then finally, D, you can see that we've got this high pressure, but we're far away from the equator now, so it's cold and very dry. So you can see how this can then impact okay, on different climatic zones around the world. And you might be able to match each picture to a particular zone. A few extra things to consider then. This is what we mentioned before then about the idea of the sun's radiation okay, or insulation. Over the equator, the sun's energy is direct on the equator. The surface area it has to heat is very intense. So it warms up very quickly. Whereas if you look towards the north here where my red dot is, you can see that the actual surface area having to heat by the sun is much larger. So the sun's energy isn't as strong, it's not as intense, so it means it's going to be a lot cooler. The other thing we have to consider is cloud cover. You can see that actually when the cloud is there, it stops the sun rays. So this, is, so this really shows this example when you look at the equator. Now because there's so much rainfall at the equator because of the low pressure, the clouds block a lot of the heat. So even though we'd associate the equator being the hottest area, it's not. It's actually in our 30 degrees north and south. Because in these areas we have high pressure, so no rainfall. So the sun's energy can heat the ground very easier and makes it really more extreme. So during the day in deserts it can reach up to 50 degrees, whereas in our rainfall in our uh, rainforest, the temperature kind of stays around about 30 degrees most of the time. So obviously hotter than the UK, but not as hot as the deserts. So when we look at when we're starting to think about how weather can be hazardous, we need to think of these extremes. Think about the which area is the hottest, which area is the coldest, windiest, and wettest and driest. Now you should have some examples of these on your knowledge organisers and the key fact sheets that you might want to use to help you. Now, when we can strip it right down and keep it simple, we could just compare two different places. Let's, for example, look at the UK and Australia. I've made a little table here showing you some extremes, showing the different types of weather we get in Australia compared to the UK. We can see temperatures are obviously higher, you know, and go back to your climatic map to see maybe why that's the case. Look at its location. The precipitation levels, though, are higher in the UK. Again, Australia may be located closer to one of those higher pressure bands, whereas the UK is closer to a lower pressure band. So it's going to probably get lots more rainfall. And then finally, wind. So the winds are much stronger okay, in Australia compared to the UK. And again, maybe look through some extra vision, look at the reasons for that. So what does this mean for you in your exam? So you might be asked to compare weather conditions in two contrasting countries. Now, we've not talked about this too much in our keys at year nine, but it's something that we can probably build into now that we've got a more overall knowledge of the geography that we've studied at GCSE. So here's an example kind of little structure, obviously using our point evidence explain as we tend to do, okay? And just keep it simple. What does it show about the differences? And obviously I've given you the point there for the first paragraph. Your evidence, the UK receives dot, dot, dot. This is where you need to start adding your data in, okay? So use the table on the previous slide to help you bring in some data here. Now we need to think about what's that gonna mean for the place? Well, if the UK is likely to get more, more rainfall, what kind of event might we have more likely to happen? Maybe things like floods. So whereas Australia, if it's going to get less rainfall, might be more likely to get things like drought. And your second paragraph might lead into that a little bit more. Think about the temperatures as well and how that can, can contribute that as well. So this is one of your tasks I want you to complete this week. Have a go at this question, okay, and send me your answer in an email. If you want to take it a little bit further, you can think about explaining why extreme pre precipitation exists in different places. Now, here we've got an example of an answer using some data about some real extremes. So here we've got kind of showing that precipitation, remember the rainfall. So the Kassai Hills in India, 
okay, they can receive up to kind of a thousand millimeters a month at their most extreme, one of the wettest places ever recorded. And it's because really over here we've got this moist air rising from the Indian Ocean, okay, it hits the hills and forced to rise, creating this relief rainfall. So this relief rainfall contributes to this lots of rainfall in this area. However, a complete contrast to that, in the Atacama Desert, which is actually next to a mountain range, because of the mountains that's near it, the air sinks and the Atacama Desert and dries out, which leads the Atacama Desert to be really, really, really dry. And it means that no rainfall is there for it, so it ends up being one of the driest places on Earth. So that's a little bit of a tricky one, requires a little bit more thought and kind of maybe a little bit more revision. But that's to show you a bit more of an extreme. The last thing I want to talk to you about today then, okay, is El Nino and La Nina. Now, I might come back to these in our next week's video as well, but this is something that was being requested to look at in a little bit more detail. So these are climate phenomenons that happen, okay, on Earth. Now, it's where we have a disruption between normal weather patterns. So where wind directions, trade winds might blow in a normal direction, they can be affected. And it can then impact on the ocean temperatures as well. And this can lead to then different weather conditions for different places. Now, we've already said that where we have low pressure, we have we have rising air, okay, which leads to wetter conditions, okay. On the opposite side of that, then, okay, we have high pressure conditions, where we have the air sinking, and when we have high pressure sinking, it leads to much drier conditions. Now, also, okay, we get it's where we have colder water because colder water doesn't evaporate. So it allows this high pressure to exist. So when we look at this um, El Nino phenomenon to start with then, you can see in a normal year along the Pacific Ocean, we can see that air wind direction blows from an east to west direction towards Australia. Now when the wind does this, these trade winds do this, it pushes that warm air across, that warm, um, pushes the air across to Australia and it pushes those warm ocean waters towards Australia. Now, because we've got warmer waters over Australia, we get more evaporation. So that means we end up with more wetter weather, lower pressure. So we end up with lots of thunderstorms and things like flooding and things like that can affect Australia. On the opposite side of that, we can see near where Peru is, we've now got these colder waters, this colder water upwelling. And because there's then no evaporation, we get these droughts. Now, I mentioned the Atacama Desert a minute ago. This is located just here. So we can see that it's going to contribute to those really dry conditions in these areas. Okay, now this can have an impact on fishermen and movement of um, fish stocks in the water and things like that, which can have also other impacts. It can also have knock on impacts to other areas in kind of in kind of America and places like that too. Now you can see in the bottom picture, El Nino then is the opposite of a normal year. In an El Nino year, the trade winds either weaken or slightly reverse, which leads to warmer waters being pushed towards greater warm waters being pushed towards South America. Now that means South America now has the warmer ocean waters, will have more evaporation and that can lead to thunderstorms and obviously things like floods. Whereas Australia now, because it's got less warm water close to it, it's going to have more maybe colder water closer to the surface, which could then lead to more droughts. As there's no evaporation taking place, we have high pressure, which can lead to these, like I say, drought conditions, which can obviously have a massive impact on Australia, considering it's already quite a dry country in lots of places. So it can make it even drier in the most extreme places. OK, so just to show you that again in a different format, then you can see the picture on the left here shows you the El Nino conditions. So the warmer ocean waters closer towards South America, you can see on the right hand side of that picture, OK, towards the east of that picture, which is going to lead to those warmer, wetter weathers over here. And because the warm water's been pushed here, you can see that actually the temperatures are slightly lower than normal in Australia, which can lead to then more droughts. Now, the one thing we didn't mention before is La Nina. Now, La Nina is the same as a normal year, but more extreme. So trade winds actually get stronger than normal, push even more warm water towards Australia, which can lead to a greater amount of evaporation, stronger storms forming and can lead to kind of things like tropical storms forming more likely in places like Australia, which can be obviously really deadly and causing lots of problems for the country. 
obviously for them places like in South America because the warmer water will even push even further we may, might even get a greater upwelling of colder water which can lead to even less evaporation taking place and even more extreme droughts in this area so that's a little bit overview of El Nino and La Nina there's some great videos out there for you to look into if you type in on YouTube or even just on Google and there might be some websites that have some good videos and some explanation if you're still a little bit unsure on this I will talk, touch base on this again next week when I go into talking about your case studies in a little bit more detail, even though this isn't part of our case studies. OK, we can link about it when we talk about droughts. So for this week, then, OK, just a couple of things. So first of all, you need to complete that exam question, which was on the slide seven. And I've repeated the question there for you to be able to do. As always, you'll have your hazardous weather quiz on show my homework for you to have a go at. And also I'm going to be completing a hazard, I'll be creating a hazardous weather GCSE pod assignment. You have two weeks to complete that assignment, whereas obviously you show my homework quizzes for only a week. If you are feel like you're on top of things, and you're doing really well, obviously look at creating your own revision materials, have a go at the exam, complete some exam questions from your revision guides. OK, and obviously feel free, as always, to email me any questions that you've got. Keep safe. Hope you well. Speak to you soon. Bye.